I'm Alan Schwartz. Uh, I run Mesenbeet Forest Centre. I'm an architect. I've done all sorts of things related to that in my life. The whole project really is a forest conservation program. I wanted to go back to my craft. The issue was really to start designing and making things that were sustainable and responsible. We make furniture, we make construction components, perfume compacts, knitting needles to South America to help people produce better alpaca sweaters, school desks, beehives for Mozambicans to expand their bee production. It all has the same ethic, it all has the same hand processes. It's all taking a resource, maximizing its value for the benefit primarily of the people who live in the place of the resource and of the de facto owners. There is a massive trade, marginally legal, definitely immoral, of timber going out of Mozambique. And they'll cut down a whole bunch of trees and cherry pick the very best and leave the rest on the ground. Now, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. These are trees which have taken a couple of hundred years to grow. You've got to respect that. This is some of the prized stuff that the world chases after. So you want to use it, and you want to use it well and give it its full value. So you design things which are going to have a long lifespan and which are going to be used well. Because if you're going to design something from wood which takes 200 years to grow, it seems kind of stupid that you turn it into something that's disposable. This is Matondo. Also timber which has got lots and lots of defects which would otherwise have been rejected. So if you take that, stitch them up, fix all these things, fill the holes where a bug might have chewed a hole, and that then becomes a really beautiful dining room top. It doesn't mean because something is utilitarian that it can't be beautiful and can't be decorated. You know, if you think of the, the ritual of entering a door, if you enter a door which has got this incredibly rich carving around it, it feels different and it gives you a completely different sense of what is behind the door. I think there's a lot of ritual in the making of things. We want to restore this craft and we want to restore something that people have always done with pride. It is partly my anarchic approach to politics and business, which is what I want to exercise here. I also don't think that there's a lot of meaning in designing yet another waterfront for people to play. If you do run a business, you might as well run it ethically and enjoyably with people who are nice to hang out with. I'm the kind of guy who shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I'm asthmatic, overweight, Jewish, non-adventurous, boring middle class. I taught at MIT. Uh, it's hell of a different <laughs> teaching grad students at one of the top universities on the planet to teaching semi-literate guys where this is the only job opportunity they're going to have in their life. Mozambique has about 6% formal sector employment. So <laughs> they're just one massive number of people around who are unemployed, underemployed, there are literally no work opportunities. Half the guys who are wood turners should actually be doctors and lawyers and accountants, but because there are no opportunities, they take the only opportunity in the neighborhood. Willingness is something that we're just not short of. We've set up a system where we don't really employ anybody. We set up a system where people work to their own account and are treated as responsible adults. And I think particularly in the area of craft, that works a lot better because it gives people a substantially greater sense of self-respect. It's not just about how much money you earn, it's about your value. What's really interesting is when you focus on people as responsible adults and treat them as that, and you help them get real value and real meaning into their work, it also coincides that they earn a hell of a lot more. There's a core group of guys who work through almost the whole year, and that's about 50 people. Right now we're doing a bunch of construction. It can be that we have upwards of 400 directly affected, and then given that the average Mozambican family size is about 10, 
that means four or five thousand people actually live off what we do, which is quite a lot given that tiny little installation made of sticks and grass. The piece of the world that's not being looked after, it's the environment. 120 million trees go up in smoke just for fuel every year. The amount of area consumed by charcoal, the loss of biomass, the loss of biodiversity in the areas around us have been absolutely enormous. Okay, um, this is a burnt out charcoal retort where the trees that were around us here have actually all been cut down and made into charcoal. It's probably about 30 or 40 trees to produce a dozen bags of charcoal and generate about $15. Besides the fact that this was once a forest and is now not. It's all very well to criticize the guy who is making the charcoal, but that really is a vain exercise because the man has to support a family, he's got to feed a family. What we're really trying to do at Mezambit is create the alternatives to this rather than just give, um, you know, the poor guy is going to do this a bloody rough time. The nursery is what drew me into being this sort of green radical, which I'm not really. I'm just a really boring middle class architect. I, in all honesty, thought that everybody who cut trees down grew new ones. That's the way the system worked. You know, you cut a tree down, you plant a new one. Um, that turned me into this environmental radical from the view of everybody else. We have 22 satellite nurseries operating at the moment. These nurseries obviously produce tons of stuff. About 150,000 trees a year are produced by that program. Uh, you can see here, for example, these are papreto. Papreto is what musical instruments are made of. Um, these are panga panga. This is umbawa, that's mahogany. Erythrenia has no timber value at all, but the birds love to nest in it. So if we get something that the birds love to nest in, we're helping uh, you know, the guys who are going to help us in establishing all of the biodiversity. All of this where we're walking uh, 12 years ago was just destroyed bush, burnt over, messed up. Um, this misanda is 12 years old. Uh, what's quite interesting with that is that I was told that you couldn't grow misanda in a nursery. Um, obviously you can't. <laughs> It is not that what we do is heroic. Okay. It's what other people do that is actually shameful. And that is that they're not putting back. You can take from the soil for a certain amount of time before there's nothing left. You can cut trees down for a certain amount of time until there are no trees left. Unfortunately, that has been the approach of resource management. It's all just about take. And I think what we're really trying to do is get people to look at give back. We've managed to get just ordinary people to understand that growing trees is really a good idea. The whole idea here of green building is that we went back to first principles in terms of what shelter really is. What do you need to be comfortable? We then said, okay, let's see how we can do that in a really elegant way. Now, elegant doesn't mean that you're wearing Armani. Elegant means done with the minimum amount of input. The basic principle of all green building is how do you do the most with the least? So that next time round we can do it even better. And I think that's really what is important about this building, not its innovation. There's nothing innovative. You know, these are thousand year old systems. It's about really consciously going about examining all of your effects, that's really what it's about. This is a building which not only demonstrates where you are, 
It also shows you, if you look at it carefully, how it's built and how all the systems in it work. So instead of hiding the solar hot water systems and the rainwater system, it's kind of in your face a little bit because we want to teach people how it works. It's sculpted out of the earth where it is. And there are a good few hundred tons of soil that were moved here. It was all done by hand. And we didn't put a bulldozer on here. This is done with spades and wheelbarrows and hard work. And I think at one stage we had over 150 people employed here building their building. We had a client for a change who was actually ahead of us in terms of wanting to be seriously green. Um, other than a very small professional team, everybody else who built here and who worked here um, is from this community. Who, people who were, um, excuse me, people who've never built anything before, uh, other than really basic, you know, sticks and grass stuff. You know, cliched American thing. This is a building which is by people, for people, and of people. The community actually built it. Here, here. It's their sweat. Thank you. The improvements are dramatic. People have not just jobs but careers. Uh, they've got a proper life. Everything we produce gets sold and finds a good home. And because everything that we produce has a story behind it, I think we really are making some progress. If we look at the example of lip balm, it's about the packaging which is natural wood. It's about the recycled paper and who actually makes the container. You know that he's earning real money from a product which would otherwise have been thrown away. And you also know that each product which is harvested is part of a replacement program. If I look at how many people considered the story of where their dining room table came from 20 years ago, and how many people consider that today, yes, we've made progress. Some people, not a lot, but some people care. And I think that's a lesson that I'd like people to learn from what I do, is that they should really examine the story of the products that they buy. Am I supporting something that I really like or not? Ask those kind of questions, not only with your tropical wood product because it's trendy, do it with everything. I think this is my life's work. I'm getting to a stage in my life where I'm not that young, I'm not that fit, I'm not that tough, but I'd rather die doing this than go back to being an architect to the in a big corporations. I mean, other guys can do that. I don't have any illusions that I'm saving the planet. I do, however, believe that if I can convince another half a dozen people like myself to put in the effort, that there's a better chance. <laughs>